before we take a look at this passage this morning, let's pray. God, we come to you asking that you would teach us this morning. We will read words off of a printed page. We will hear those words preached. But Lord, we want to be taught by you. We want to hear from you. So send your spirit among us now that we might know and experience and have a divine encounter. In Jesus' name, amen. My plan this morning is twofold. I want to walk through the text, explaining or expositing the text. And then once we've done that, I want to then secondly ask ourselves, what does this mean for us? Apply this. How does this come to us in 2023? By way of review, it's been a number of weeks, perhaps a couple months since, we've, since I've been here and we've been in 1 Thessalonians. I want you just to know two things by way of review. First of all, in the first three chapters of this letter, Paul was talking to the Thessalonians about their salvation. He was talking to the Thessalonians about how God came among them, met them, and how they were called out of their idolatry and out of their rebellion into his kingdom and into his glory. So in these first three chapters, Paul's saying, or God is saying, this is what I've done for you. And now, secondly, by way of review, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, Paul and God are going to give instructions. Now, in light of what I've done for you, this is how you're to live. And so last time we were here in chapter 4, the instructions that Paul gave were how to behave in a way that honors God sexually. With our sexual ethic and our behavior, how can we honor God? And today, what Paul is going to deal with is our love for our brother and our lives in front of a watching world. <clears throat> so take a look at verses 9 in 10 of chapter 4. Paul says something kind of, you could say comical almost. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed what you are doing in all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you brothers to do this more and more. So I said Paul writes something that could almost be considered comical. I don't need to say anything to you but I'm going to say stuff to you. Well, I don't need to write anything, but I'm going to write stuff to you. So why does Paul, first of all, say he doesn't need to write anything? I think we could give maybe three reasons why he says, I don't need to write to you. First of all, he had already been with them in person. He's like, I already told you all this stuff in person. I don't have to write it down. But secondly, I think Paul says, I don't need to write to you. I, Paul, the human, don't need to write to you because you've been taught by God. It's kind of like, Somebody up here who says, oh, I, I just had basketball lessons from Michael Jordan, and I say, well, I'm going to come along and teach you something new. <laughs> they don't need it. And thirdly, I think Paul says, I don't need to write to you about this love stuff because you're already doing it. So then we need to ask the question, Paul, why are you writing to them if you don't need to? They already know it. They've already been taught by God, and they're already doing it. Why are you writing to them? Well, let me give two reasons for this. Paul says, I want you to do it more. I want you to do it more and more. So if I want to say that, I have to write something about this topic of love because I want you to not grow weary in doing good. In fact, we haven't reached perfection in this. You haven't reached perfection in this. So continue doing it more and more. But I think there's another reason Paul is writing this because if you look, there's this phrase in here in verse 9, you have been taught by God to love one another. Paul could have said, I don't need to write to you because you've been taught to love one another. He could have just left out, you've been taught by God. I think Paul has something going on in his mind. I can't definitively say this, but I think he wanted them to see that in their human reality, in their human experience, they met Paul, Silas, Timothy. They had the gospel preached to them. They turned away from their idols. I think he wanted them to realize in all of that human experience, there was something divine happening. They had had a divine encounter. And I think he wanted them to make them aware of that in case they were, maybe just by the reality of human existence, missing it. And I wonder, that's something that we need to hear this morning as well. Paul had said in chapter 1, verse 5, something similar. I guess you could call it a parallel statement. He said, when we came among you, the gospel came in power and in conviction and in the Holy Spirit. 
Paul's saying essentially the same thing. Look, you had a human experience, but there was really something divine going on when the gospel came to you. Now, I don't want us to think that in verse 9, this phrase, you have been taught by God, is something that Paul was just sitting around thinking, yeah, I want them to remember this divine encounter that happened and not just think it was a human. Paul didn't just make up this phrase, you've been taught by God. There's quite a bit of history that I want to show us in a brief next couple moments. You don't need to turn there, but in Isaiah 54, which note comes after Isaiah 53, which some of you may be familiar with, Isaiah is proclaiming to the people of Israel the gospel of the new covenant. He's talking to them about the promises that are going to come when the Messiah comes. And he talks a little bit about how they were barren, spiritually speaking. They didn't have children. But he says, you're going to eventually one day have a lot of children, spiritual children. And then he says this, and they will all be taught by God. So this is Paul reaching back to what Isaiah had prophesied. And so Isaiah was saying, all your children are going to be taught by priests. No, he wasn't saying that. All your children are going to be taught by prophets, are going to be taught by apostles. No, no, no. All your children are going to be taught by God. And then Jesus takes this same phrase. Jesus in John chapter 6, he's teaching people that he's the bread of life. And then he makes this statement in John 6, 45. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. So Jesus reaches back and grabs what Isaiah says. He says, and they will all be taught by God. So he quotes Isaiah, and then Jesus interprets it and says, everyone who has learned and been, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father I'm just going to pause and say, what do you think Jesus is going to say next? Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Everyone who is taught by God is coming to Jesus. Everyone who truly hears from God and has a divine encounter does what? Comes to Christ. The most important question we need to ask this morning, all of us, is have we been taught by God? Not have we come to church this morning, not are we a member of this church, not have we been baptized, not have we prayed a prayer, but have we been taught by God? Have we come into the classroom of Christ and learned from Him? We'll come back to this in a little while. Look now at verse 10. I read that a little bit ago. Paul says, You've been taught by God to love one another, verse 10, for indeed that is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. So Paul says to these Thessalonians, look, you guys have been loving one another, and that's good, and I want you to do this more. But he's not just talking Thessalonian believer to Thessalonian believer. You might remember a couple months back, we looked at some of the, in Acts 17, how the Thessalonians came to Christ. And there was this guy named Jason there, and then I also mentioned a couple other Thessalonians that traveled along with Paul, a guy named Aristarchus and a guy named Secundus. These Jasons and Secunduses and Aristarchuses were loving one another, and Paul says, you're doing a great job at that. But then he goes a little bit further, and he says, this is what you were doing to all the brothers in Macedonia. So now we need to have a little geography review. A couple months back, put a map on the screen, Thessalonica was there, and then I'm going to have you give me an answer in a minute, so be be prepared to shout something out here. Thessalonica was here, and then there was to the northeast, your perspective, northeast, a little, another town, city, that Paul and his companions visited, and to the southwest, there was another city, Thessalonica was in the middle. These three cities, by the way, were approximately the distance from Dayton, Columbus, and Cincinnati to one another without cars. Tell me, do you remember, what were the names of these other two cities? Anybody just shout it out. Berea was one of them. Joel can't answer. What's the next one? Anybody remember the other one? Lydia lived there, or was there. And there was a jailer there, and it was in Philippi. So the Thessalonican believers lived in Thessalonica. Up here was Philippi and Lydia and this unnamed jailer. And down here in Berea were these guys who were noble and studying the scriptures. And Paul says, you Thessalonians, you're loving them all, not just one another, but you are loving everybody in that region. And so 
This is what Paul's getting at in verses 9 and 10. Brothers, you're loving one another. Keep it up. You're doing a great job. Then he switches a little bit, and he transitions now in verses 11 and 12. Look at those. He's now going to talk about, I don't want you just to love the believers. I also have in mind all those unbelievers that you live among. So he says, I want you to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So notice the structure here in, these, in verse 11. He gives three commands, and then he gives a purpose statement. The purpose statement is, I want you to walk properly before all these other idol-worshiping Thessalonians and all those other people in Macedonia. And what are these three commands I want you to do? Take a look at them. Number one, aspire to live quietly. One commentator said this is kind of a paradoxical statement because he's actually saying, be ambitious to be quiet. It's like, what are you saying, Paul, here? I want you to be really anxious and be excited about being quiet. Paul's point is he doesn't want them out making a big stir in the community, causing quarrels and causing problems, not being loud and obnoxious. And if you think about Romans 12, 18, let me quote it for you here. As far as it depends on you, live peaceably. You could almost say quietly with all. The second command he gives, he says, I want you to mind your own affairs. We could change affairs. The word affairs actually isn't in the original. It just says, mind your own stuff. Mind your own affairs. Mind your own business. We might say, don't be sticking your nose in other people's business unless it is biblically required of you. That's the negative side of that. The positive side is what should you be doing? Taking care of your own business, taking care of your own family, taking care of your own finances, taking care of your own property or whatever civic responsibilities you have, making sure you have food to eat. And number three, to work with your own hands. Work with your, so he says, be quiet or live in a quiet manner. He says, take care of your own issues and work with your own hands. The idea here is that you are doing your own work, not waiting for somebody else to come along and do your work for you. The same idea Paul presents in Ephesians 4.28. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. Let the thief steal no longer, but let him work with his own hands so he has something to share. Rather, don't be sitting around waiting for somebody else to get your stuff and go steal it from him. But no, you go and do your own work. Now he does say here, to work with your own hands. I think it's probably appropriate to say, you could also say work with your own mind. I don't think Paul is promoting here only blue collar work. He's promoting doing your own work. But yet Thessalonica would have been in some ways a blue collar society, so perhaps that's what he's getting at here. And ultimately, he has two, I said he has one purpose here. The purpose is so that you can live properly before the outsiders. He wants the outsiders to see how you live. But at the end of verse 12, he also says, so that you are dependent on no one. Another translation says, so that you lack nothing. So that gives us some help. Like, be working so that you can provide for those things that you need, so that you don't have to go around asking from others. And again, why does Paul say this? Why does he want it? He doesn't just think about loving the brothers. He's thinking, adorn the gospel for these outsiders. There are many people that you are engaging with. Let them see how you live and let that be a testimony to the gospel. So I want to pause and I want to say that's essentially what Paul's trying to communicate to the Thessalonians. So now I want to transition and say, what does that mean for us? We live in 2023, we don't live in Thessalonica, and we're not anywhere near Berea or Philippi. So how do we apply this to our lives? And what I'd like to do is I want to move through the passage backwards, bringing some applications. And the first one here is, we need to be going to work in order to adorn the gospel. We need to go to work to adorn the gospel. God wants you to go to work tomorrow morning. And for some of you, that work is fairly traditional. You go off to some office, some job, some construction site, some somewhere, and you do your work. 
But for others of you, that work for this season of your life is you open up a book and you go to, you go to class and you open up a book and you study and that's your work. Or you, in your house, you go sit at the kitchen table, you open up a book and you study there. But God wants us to be working and it's proper and it's good. Work was created before the fall. It's a good thing. And so how do we do our work? We live about our lives quietly, not stirring up trouble, not putting our nose in our neighbor's business when it doesn't need to be there. It means we don't cheat at school. We do our own work. It means when you're in the office, you're not lazy and sitting around making somebody else do the work that you're supposed to be doing. And when we live in this way, we honor the Lord, we please the Lord, and our lives adorn the gospel. Sometimes we can think something different than what I just articulated. We can think our lives are only profitable when we are involved in some kind of ministry and so work is less honorable, less admirable, less pleasing to the Lord. And what Paul is saying here is no. Go do your work and in doing that, you honor him and you adorn the gospel. There is a misapplication of this verse that I want to point out. You be quiet You work with your own hands, and you mind your own business, and you go and you live inside of some walls, and you stay inside of those walls as if in a monastery or something like that. I don't think that's Paul. what Paul is getting at here. He's not, he's not talking about outsiders who are physically outside of some compound on which you live. He's talking about those who are outside of the kingdom of God, not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. So let us be those people who, when we wake up on Monday morning and don't feel like going to work and don't feel like going to school, remember the exhortation that we have from God that we are to be doing our work. And in doing that, we testify to those who are outside the kingdom of God. Application number two, and there will be three of these. The third one will be the, the longest. Application number two here, love your brothers and sisters from other churches and from other cities. So I want us to think for a little bit as a body, as a corporate body, as Arbor Church, how do we love brothers and sisters from other churches and from other cities? This is Paul's encouraging them to do this more and more. And so I want to encourage us, let's do this more and more. But how do we do it? So first of all, I want to thank the guys who pray publicly each week up here. What do you notice they do? They're praying among other things. They're praying for ourselves, our own church, but they're praying for other churches in other cities. And in doing that, we are loving them. And I want to encourage us, as those who are not up here doing the praying, to actually be praying for them along with these guys in our hearts, joining with them in their prayer. And in doing so, we're loving those other churches. I'm also thankful for the times when, as a church, we have joint services or other activities that engage and and partner with other churches. Think of it. i got a small list here a Reformation service, a VBS, maybe some kind of musical event, maybe a gospel coalition meeting or, or conference. These are ways that Arbor Church can love, can connect with, can show a unified, a, a unity in the gospel with other churches in other cities or even in our own city. So I want to encourage us to take advantage of those opportunities to love and to fellowship with other churches. But I think there's something that's in here, in in what we're discussing right here, that can be a temptation for us that's not helpful. And that's the temptation when sometimes you look at another church, maybe they're not just like you. Maybe their culture is not exactly the same. And you look at that other church, or you look at those other people, and you think suspicious thoughts about them. Or you think, oh, they're different. And i I, there, just must, but there must be something wrong with that church. Or we're tempted to view them as if there's some kind of deficiency in them. Of course there's a deficiency in some other kind of church, just as there's deficiencies in our church. And if we knew them, we would seek to change them. And so as we look at our brothers and sisters who are in other churches, other denominations, other theological traditions, in other cities, let's look at them with grace, let's love them, and let's seek to take advantage of the opportunities to engage with them and to partner with Him. We serve the same Lord. We are saved by the same Lord. We are taught 
by the same Lord as well. So may we guard against an attitude that says, we're the only ones who have got it right. And finally now, by way of application, we need to seek to be taught by God. Let me say this in two ways. We need to seek to be taught by God, period. Or we could say, we need to seek to be taught by God to love one another. How often do we walk about our Christian lives and have our eyes, not intentionally, but for whatever reason, simply looking at the human experience that's going on? We're living by sight and not by faith. How often do we fail to recognize God's normal activity in our lives? And I want to emphasize this. God's normal activity. I'm not talking about miraculous encounters or mystical experiences. I'm talking about when we, in a context just like this, or maybe in a context on Thursday morning before you go to work or before you go to school and you're sitting and you're reading and you're praying, how much do we actively plead for, seek for, or recognize the fact that there's the possibility of a divine encounter with the almighty triune God happening? Even in our coming here this morning, when you got up and you were getting ready, were you primarily coming here to meet with God? Was that actively in the front of your mind? Or were you coming here because you had a responsibility here? Maybe because you knew you would see some friends here? What was our rationale and our reason for coming this morning? Let me, let me point us back to chapter 2 of Thessalonians for a minute. Paul gave an example there, a, a, some, a parallel thing. He said, just listen, when you receive the word of God, you accepted it as the word of God. That's what he says to the Thessalonians. When you receive the word of God, you accept it as, well, of course. If I like heard God speaking in the sky, I'd be like, well, okay, that's God's word. That's not what Paul, that's not what happened to them. And that's not what Paul said. He actually said, when you receive the word of God, listen to this, which you heard from me, which you heard from us, Paul, Silas, Timothy, you accepted it at, not as the word of men, but as the word of God. So he says, when you had a human experience with some words on a page or with some guys who were telling you a message, you recognized that that was God speaking to you, and you accepted it as that. Let me give you the Ryan Stern paraphrase of the verse I just read. When you had a divine encounter, which occurred in the midst of your human experience of hearing the gospel, you recognized it not as a human experience simply, but as a divine encounter. I'm going to give you something that you can chase down later this afternoon if you have some time. Ephesians 2, 17. Don't look there now, but just if you want to run to Ephesians 2, 17 later on. Paul says something really interesting. He says to the Ephesians, Christ came and proclaimed peace to you, Ephesians. Now you just sit back and think for a little bit about your knowledge of the Gospels. When did Jesus go to Ephesus and preach to Ephesian believers? He never did. But what's going on here? Paul says, when I was in Ephesus among you, and I proclaimed, and some of these other guys who proclaimed the word of God to you, Christ, the resurrected Christ, came and proclaimed, or the resurrected Christ came and taught you, and taught you about peace, and proclaimed peace to you. The same thing can be happening even now. The resurrected Christ can be coming and proclaiming his word to us and teaching us how to love one another. I asked you earlier, but I want to ask you again. Have you been taught by God? Have you sat at the feet of Jesus and heard from him? He's not physically going to walk among you, but he can come spiritually and preach to you and teach you. Have you listened to the Holy Spirit as he's been pressing you about your sin? Perhaps through some human messenger who has confronted you with your sin. Are you listening to him? And again, the question is not, have we gone to church? It's not, have we sat through family devotions or led family devotions? It's the question of, have we heard from God in our hearts? Pretty regularly, there are Two people who hear the exact same sermon from the exact same person, the exact same words, and one of those individuals is engaging with God, and the other one is just hearing sound waves. One of them is on the road to the celestial city, and the other one is headed back to the city of destruction. You see, by nature, our reality is we don't want to hear from God. We don't need a teacher, 
We think we've got it all going on in the way we are. I don't need somebody to teach me. I'm just fine the way I am. We're perfectly content, content to live in our sin. And so I want us to just think now, when we are taught by God, if you are having this experience of hearing God's word, perhaps proclaimed from an individual or perhaps reading it off the page yourself, what does that experience look like? God comes and he teaches you about his holiness. He teaches you about his character. He teaches you about his law. And what he does is what Jesus said. Anyone who's heard from God comes to me. When you have this experience, you are called and urged and moved to come to Christ. In addition, God teaches us about ourselves. He teaches us that we're made in his image. He teaches us that we mar that image every day. And he teaches us about the cross and the resurrection and about repentance and faith. And he teaches us about how to love one another. And he teaches us how to live before a watching world. Now, I think there's something very interesting here. Think about when you go to school. Many of you are in school right now. You go and you sit in school and most of, from my experience, most of your teaching that you're hearing is information, information, information. What God taught the Thessalonians, I'm not denying that he taught them information. There was information there. But he taught them a skill, how to love somebody. You can be taught all the information you want and look at that person and say, Ugh, how do I love that person? When God teaches us, he's not just filling our heads with information. He's teaching us how to put that truth into practice, how to love, how to pray, how to live. Titus, in Paul's writings to Titus, he says, God's grace, God himself is teaching us to say no to ungodliness. He's teaching us a skill. So what I'm saying is here, as we engage with the scriptures, as we hear God's word proclaimed, are we being taught how to live, how to think, how to love? It's not sufficient just to hear the word of the apostles. It's not sufficient to be taught by godly men and women. We need to have this divine encounter. And again, I'm not talking about listening to YouTube or sitting out in the woods and having some mystical experience. It's in the context of hearing God's word proclaimed or read. This experience is when we see with the eyes of faith God's love toward us, and we want to show that love towards others. It's when we come to realize God's love towards us as those rebellious students who don't want the teacher, and yet he continues to come to us. It's that experience where we see his love towards us, and we're overwhelmed by his grace, and we recognize Romans 5, 8, God showed his love to us while we were still sinners. That's what God's love to us looks like. And that's what the Thessalonian love toward the other brothers looked like. Now I mentioned here a couple times that we are ungodly people, that we're sinful, that we're weak, and that we're rebellious, and yet God loves us. And you might be thinking, well, but wait a minute, Paul in this passage is talking about loving brothers. You're talking about loving the ungodly people, the enemies. Well, think about this Thessalonian church for a moment. This letter was written to the Thessalonians not too long after Paul had been there, perhaps a few months. This is not a church of Thessalonian believers that have been in the faith for 30 years, mature, sanctified, holy. No, last time Paul talked to them about their sexual ethic and their behavior, probably because they were having trouble with this kind of thing. They were not all just super spiritual people here. They were probably a lot like us. Probably some were annoying and irritating, Many of them grumbled and complained. I suspect there were spouses who fought and exchanged angry words, hurt one another, probably disobedient children, harsh parents, young people who were misunderstood, and older folks who felt unappreciated. And Paul says, you are loving one another. You've been taught to love one another. Think about your character of your love recently. How have you been loving to that annoying roommate or dorm mate or classmate? How have you been loving your spouse when he or she has been an unreasonable grouch? How have you been treating your brother or your sister that you just don't like? Until the Lord returns, 
all of us are going to need to be taught by the Lord to love one another. You all are going to need to be taught by God to love me because I'm going to be ugly sometimes. All of us are going to be need to taught need to have been taught by God to love you because you're going to be ugly sometimes. And like Paul, we will want to do the good, but because of our remaining sin, the evil will still be present with us. And so we need to be taught by God. And yet this passage gives us great hope. Listen to this. It's hope for our marriages, hope for our parents, parenting, hope for our broken relationships, because there is a God who wants to teach us. There is a God who is able to teach us. And there is a God who when we sit with him and when we hear from him and when we're taught from him, we're changed. That God doesn't fail in his lessons to us. We learn and we change. That's the promise of our Lord. That's the promise of the new covenant. They will all be taught by God. If I can put it in another way, It's a promise that we will be accepted into the greatest university with the greatest professor studying the greatest topic and that professor never fails and none of the students that he ever has fail to learn what he's teaching them. But it's not just a promise. It's also a call to obedience. It's a call to attend that university. It's a call to sit with that professor And it's a call for us to confess that many times we don't. Many times we skip class. Many times we're in class and we're not paying attention. Many times we're just going through the motions but not learning anything from him. Sometimes we reject the invitation to study. We refuse his offer to bring us out of our own self-deception. And like Eve, we choose to follow a different teacher, the father of lies. And yet, our Lord Jesus still says, come, come. And that's what he says to us this morning. Come again into his presence. And what does he say in Matthew eleven twenty eight? 28? Come to me and learn from me. If I can take a little bit of freedom here, my lessons are easy. It's a pretty audacious claim to say that we can be taught by God. But our passage today teaches us that we are to love one another as we've been taught by Christ. And from an earthly perspective, yes, it's words written on a page. Yes, it's words proclaimed by a human. But the reality is, if we are in Christ, we are being taught by him, our Lord and our Savior. What an amazing reality. What an amazing privilege. What an amazing God. Let's pray. God, you are the creator of heaven and earth, and you have created every single soul that is sitting in this room this morning, and you invite us to come and to learn from you and to be taught by you. Father, I pray for those who are not believers this morning, who are not your children, who have never been taught by you, I pray that they would come that they would repent of their sin, that they would repent of their rebellion and come to you and learn from you and be taught by you. And Lord, I pray for those of us who do know Christ, that you would renew our hearts to come and hear from you as well, to be taught to love one another, not to love those who, not simply to love those who like us and who are easy to like, but Lord, to love those who sometimes seem to be our enemies. Whether it's a spouse, a child, a father, an in-law, or a neighbor, Lord, help us. Teach us. Teach us that skill. Teach us how to put your truth into practice, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.